welcome. This is Talking Art, and I'm Jane Trejere. We're at the Deerfield Arts Bank, and we're continuing our conversation with local artists. Today, we have Richard Cohen with us. Uh, I would like to remind you that at the bottom of the screen, you'll see an email address. If there are questions that you'd like me to be asking that I'm not asking, please let me know. And if there are things that you'd like to comment about, that's the place to do it also. Um, so without further ado, here we are. Richard Cohen, welcome to the Deerfield Arts Bank. Thank you. Welcome to Talking Art. Thank you very much for having me, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we'll see. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you'll change your mind. <laughs> no. No. We'll have a good time. So first, I like to ask people, where are you from? Where do you originate? And how did you get to this region? That is a question that could actually take a while to answer, well, but I will be, I will be succinct. Oh, I, good, thank you. I was <laughs> born in Manhattan, grew oh. up in northern New Jersey. I went to college in Pennsylvania, New York, Philadelphia, and ended up in Delaware. I was in Delaware for 23 years, then Princeton, New Jersey. And then we decided to retire, or in my case, semi-retire, and we moved to Amherst based on two years of road trips and research. And we're very happy to be here. You researched the area? Uh, Liza, my wife, researched the area. She's a librarian and loves to do research. And, and what were you looking for? We were looking for a town with um, a good Jewish community and a college and libraries and beautiful scenery and wonderful people, and we found it all. So we couldn't be happier to be here. I think somebody like tra uh, Tourism Office should hire you to, to, to speak for, for Actually, them. some friends have consulted with Eliza, and at least one friend has moved to this area based on Eliza's research and, and based on her endorsement of the area. That's amazing. So. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. What a, what a well, lovely way to begin a new life. I, I agree. So now, I heard that there were several places you went to college. Without being too silly, were you dropping out of college or did you move on to get different degrees? I'm just overeducated. I see. And what are you overeducated in? Well, I, I went to undergraduate college at Allegheny College in western Pennsylvania. And then I went to graduate school in English at University of Rochester. Rochester, New York, uh -huh. and then law school in University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I intended to become a professor of English, but the job market was so bad that I decided to change careers at that point uh -huh. and go to law school. Was that a good decision eventually? Eventually, it was a very good decision. I love practicing law. I still practice part-time. And it, it's challenging, it's intellectually stimulating, and I feel that I'm helping people as well. So I, I really have loved practicing law. That's nice. That's wonderful to yeah. hear. So where does art fit in here at all? Uh, art did not fit in very much until, at least painting did not fit in, until about nine years ago. But I've been... Is that when you came here? No, that was when I was in New Jersey, uh -huh. when I was in Princeton. But I had been taking photographs uh, pretty seriously for about 35 years before I started painting. So I think that helped me uh, define some artistic sensibility and it helped me... Train your eye. Helped train my eye, helped uh, give me a sense of composition, and um, I especially appreciate black and white photography. That's primarily what I do. I still do some photography. Why do you appreciate black and white? Because of the, the light that, that is so important in black and white photography. Um, the darks, the lights, the contrasts are just so crucial. Colors, um, for me, are in some ways not as important as the darks and the lights and the contrasts of color and the quality of the light. Now you say this while we're sitting in front of a picture of yours that is definitely not black and white. This is relatively new. This okay. is relatively new. We'll, we'll take a look at at least okay. a few paintings before too long that 
I'm, or more my photographer eye as opposed to painting eye. I see. But I'm trying to insert more color into my paintings as time goes on. I'm trying to <coughs> change, at least to some extent, my style of painting to include a wider range of color. Because uh -huh. my palette is pretty narrow <coughs> right now. And, okay. and some of that, I think, is the influence of the black and white photography. I, I can see that. We're, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So did you actually, your, your pri besides photography, your medium is pastel. True, correct. So did you take classes, or did you just pick up pastels and just know how to do it? I literally just picked up pastels off the street. I was walking around the streets of the town I lived in in Delaware, Newcastle, Delaware, with my daughter Lucy, who is actually an excellent artist, and she's the one who's responsible for getting me involved in painting in the first place. We were walking down the streets of Newcastle on the night before garbage day, and there were literally six or seven uh, bags of pastels that someone was throwing away. Like this bag you have here? Like the bag I have here. Except four, bigger. Bigger, uh, many more bags like this. Hundreds of sticks of pastels that were being disposed of. My daughter Lucy recognized them as an artist, and she said, Dad, we need to pick these up and use them. Pastels, <laughs> so it good was, pastels are very expensive. They are expensive. It was literally hundreds of dollars worth of pastels, and they were all in good shape. They were, they were fine. So, <clears throat> pick a pastel. Pick a, pick any a pastel. Any, any, any one. Sure. So you have this pastel in your hand, and you started playing with it on paper. I started playing with it a little bit on paper, but it was only about maybe six months later, we were in Maine, where we have a house, and my daughter Lucy one day said, let's go to the shore, let's go to the rocks, and we'll bring some pastels, we'll bring paper, and we'll have some fun. And we did that, and that was really my first true experience of using pastels. And it was so much okay. fun that I was hooked. It was love at first try. Oh. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I could say that about um, most of the mediums that I picked up. But I, uh, or some, I could definitely right. say, no, this is not love right. at first try. Yeah, I, so I that's, don't. That's that's really. I don't. This is the part of the story that we can't exactly control. One no, can, one can't imitate that exactly. It was almost fate, if I can. I don't really believe in fate, but it was fate. I see. It was meant to be. I'm not saying that I was any good at pastels when I first so how started long, painting. How, how long did it take before you actually looked at your work and said, "That's good"? I would say at least two or three years. I would say at least so two or three years. So you kept at this for two or three years, knowing that it wasn't so good. Because I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. So tell me about the process, that, what you it's, enjoyed specifically. To me, the process is by far the most important component of painting. You know, if you get a great product, if you love the painting that comes out of the process, that's wonderful, that's gravy, that's icing on the cake. But for me, it's the process that is the most important part of painting. And let me try to describe it. As a lawyer, I'm always using the left side of my brain, the rational, the verbal side of the brain, the analytical side. And that's all well and good. But I think everyone, including myself, has a very strong need to access the right side of the brain, the creative part of the brain, the nonverbal part of the brain. And I think almost everyone in their lives has had some experience of being in a zone, of you know, being almost out of time, being in a mental state where the rest of the world goes away and your creative flow is just pouring out. And that's a wonderful place to be. It's not a place that we can be for very long. It's not a place we can be that often, but it's a wonderful place to be. It's a place of peace and contentment and creativity that is, is hard to articulate, but it's a wonderful place and I love to be there. That's what painting is for me. Mm -hmm. 
So tell us a little bit about your first efforts that, that seemed to satisfy you. You said you worked landscapes. I Everything we're going to see today yes. is landscapes. Yes. I, I have taken classes and drawing where I've done uh, figures, I've done still lifes, but for me, landscapes are really my, my, my love because I love to be outside, I love to uh, feel the air, I love to see the light, um, especially later in the day or very early in the day. But the light any time of the day can be beautiful. And that's where our landscapes really come in. That captures, you can capture the light and the, just the beauty of nature. So probably my, my best experiences early on were doing plain air painting, plain air painting outside where I could really see the vibrancy of the colors fully in the light. So that was very, very enjoyable just being outside. And then the painting added to that experience <laughs> of being outside. So I, I would say that was probably my first really um, wonderful experience painting. But early on, I was, I was, it was really trial and error. It was, it's a difficult technical medium in some ways. It seems very simple, and in some ways it, it is simple. It doesn't seem simple to me. Can you uh, talk about, well, well, maybe as we, let's take a picture and let's, let's work on that. Certainly. So th this one here with the, it looks to me like we're in a public garden in the late afternoon, but it's a sunny, there's a sun out. So we've got a lot of shadow. I've got the right time of day or is it morning? It's, uh, it's sort of late afternoon. Yeah. So we have it's some trees and a, and a walkway or a draw right. or a road. Right. This is, this actually was painted in my studio. It was not plein air. It was um, just something that I imagined. A lot of my paintings come from imagination or it comes from memory and often a composite of different memories of being in the outdoors. This came really more from a memory of, of being in a garden um, where there was a walkway, there were some beautiful shade trees, and I wanted to capture the light and just the atmosphere of being in that kind of How many years ago did you do this? That was 2007. So that was one of my very first paintings that I would want to frame. <laughs> there were a number of paintings I did that I still have. So in another <laughs> circumstance, if you're not painting outdoors, would you right. paint from a photograph? Many people do that. Occasionally I paint from a photograph. Not frequently, but occasionally I paint from photographs. And um, one photograph that I painted from was the painting of the mountains. I, I don't know if that's... You didn't go there. I was there, but I, I took a photograph. That's the San Francisco Peaks in Flagstaff, Arizona. Painting from photographs is much easier than painting from imagination. Well, yes, I was, I was, I was wondering how you imagine shadows, if they actually all work, part of my right brain my, wait a second, which side? My, my right brain was at work here, thinking, right. hmm, is that the way the shadows work? And, uh, you know, do they go that long? And I, I said, no, 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 stop doing that. But, but the, the fact is, once you told me that you weren't actually looking at it, but you were imagining it, that's where m my mind went a little bit. Right. It doesn't really matter, but, right. but uh, it's hard to remember. Exactly. So I could see how a photograph might be useful if you're not going to be able to stay there. When you use your imagination and paint from the imagination, then there is definitely going to be inaccuracies, which is fine because my goal is not to take a photograph yes. in, in pastel. My goal is to use the imagination to change reality the way that I would like to see reality at that ah, time. At that time. 
I see. And, and may or may not be representative of reality. So where did you move on to after that sort of? Yeah, did I, you, I, I've seen more of your work, and there are a lot of landscapes with trees, right. like this one. Right. So there was, a, there was a lot more of this kind of work, I think. I, I do love to paint trees. I love trees. <laughs> um, but I have found myself actually moving away from trees a little bit. I'm not sure why. Every once in a while, I will go back to trees. Um, but lately, I've been doing uh, more long-distance landscapes I, I where the trees may or may not be there. If they are, they're very, very small right. and right. not really discernible. Um, so I think I've focused a little bit more on clouds, a little bit more on a wider, so let's larger move on, landscape. So let's move on to the next one. Okay. Here is this, um, where are we here? This one is imagination. It's a river at night with the light uh, hitting the water. And, and this, I think, is pretty representative of what I often try to do, which is to accentuate the contrast between the lights and the darks. The darker, actually, you have the sky or the landscape, the brighter the light is going to appear. And I love to play with that kind of really stark contrast between the light and the dark. Well, I think one would have had to look at many, many skies and many, many rivers shimmering with light to be able to do this from memory. Yeah. What, is the, what is the white in the, uh, at, the, at the horizon? That's a gap in the clouds where light is, is streaming through. So to, to have the light on the river, to have the light on the, uh, in that foreground, you, you have to have some light coming from the sky. The rest of the sky is very dark. So that's a concession to realism, a little bit of a concession I to see. realism, uh -huh. to have some light coming from the sky to permit that light shining in the river. I know sometimes I look at the sky. I often take photographs. I'm not a photographer. But if I have my camera, I will say, or I'll run to get it, that's an unbelievable sky. But the fact is, the sky is always unbelievable. It's just sometimes it's more unbelievable than other times. And sometimes you say, if I drew that sky, it, no one would believe that there was a real sky that looked like that. But the sky can look any way you can possibly imagine. It's all up there. Yeah. And so, you know, <clears throat> people like to draw clouds that look, well, perhaps a little bit more like that over there. But the fact is the clouds most often don't look like that. They look like yeah. this, or right. this, or that. So the variety here is amazing, right. and it's not imagination, because it's all possible, and it's all true. But this one is from a photograph, you said. This mountains, the that San one Francisco is a photograph. Mountain. Not the clouds, but the, the mountains are from a photograph. Oh, so the clouds are back to, to your imagination. The clouds imagination. are back to memory, imagination. And, and sometimes I conflate imagination and memory. Uh huh. So what time span between uh -huh. these two? Or is this looks like it was recently done to get at the same time? I'd say the mountains were done about a year or so after the river. Oh. So fairly recently, maybe even a little bit less than that. I came back from a trip to Flagstaff, Arizona to visit my daughter, <coughs> who... This is the same daughter? The same daughter, Lucy. Ah, who she's is, a very important person uh, in this she's story. She's a very important person. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's an inspiration. She works in a park in Portland, Oregon, right now, doing trail work and environmental education. And she's doing what work? Trail work. She is trail work? Trail work. Uh -huh. She is very good with a chainsaw. And uh, she's a wilderness first responder and also does environmental education wow. and uh, is a very, a very impressive girl, woman, and, and also is an excellent artist. Uh -huh. So this was really done as, as a gift to her. Eventually, I will get this out to Portland, Oregon to, to give to Lucy, but I 
was blown away by the San Francisco peaks. They just rise out of this plain. Uh, it's at a very high elevation, and there's snow on the peaks almost all year, and the light on the peaks is incredible. I, I can see why you would want to make sure that you had them right, because they are not generic. Uh -huh. They are very specific. Yes. Right. So when you, when you handle the pastel, the pastel is very messy, yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. And there's like, I think I saw in your studio you actually have a vacuum. I, uh, I do. To, to, uh, in the air, to, to clean the air, right? I do. One, one of the problems with pastel is it is messy. It uh, gets in your hands. You can use gloves, of course. I usually do not use gloves. I like to feel the pastel. But they're dusty just by their nature. The pastel is made of very fine pigments, very finely ground pigments that are bound together with some kind of binder such as gum arabic, but they do disintegrate and they get very dusty. So I have this device under my easel which sucks the dust up and takes it into a filter. So it's a very safe way of painting with pastels and I recommend it to any pastel artist or any oil color, any oil artist as well, because it'll suck the fumes of the oils into the filter as well. Mm -hmm. It's called artist air. Artist air. Artist air. So I know that in pastels, I see. I, I'm not a pastel artist, so <clears throat> I'm just speaking without any great knowledge. There's something called crepes. There's something called oil pastels, and I'm assuming there are other names. What, what, is this a different binder? There is a difference in the composition or the ratio of binder and pigment. There are soft pastels, primarily soft pastels, hard pastels. There are pastel pencils, of course. There are oil pastels. And the main difference is the composition of the stick. In a soft pastel, you have more pigment, less binder. In a hard pastel, you have more binder, less pigment. Oil pastel, you have <coughs> different materials that are binding. It's, it's not really gum arabic. It's, it's a different kind of material that's Oil? actually binding. It's, it's oily. It's oily. It's almost like a crayon. So the effect on the, on the paper is different, and also the different types of paper, right? Yes. So can you talk to us about the paper? <coughs> what paper do you use, and sure. what can you teach us about the paper that people use? For the paper is absolutely critical, and it was a real issue for me when I first started using pastels that the paper was not grabbing. It didn't have the teeth. So what paper are we looking at here? The is this teeth paper? This is paper with teeth, and it's either Wallace paper. These are Wallace paper, the larger the blue, the, pastels. The two mountains <coughs> and the river ones, that's Wallace paper. That's Wallace paper. And, the, and, these, and these ones that we're going to speak about in a minute? Uh, that cloud is also Wallace paper. The smaller pastel is something called pastel matte. And this was actually the first painting that I ever did on the pastel mat. Pastel mat was, was a great discovery, courtesy of my teacher, Kathleen Galligan, who was very instrumental in, in, my, past, in my career as a pastel artist. Is she local? No, she's actually in Bristol, Maine. Oh. I took a week-long plein air uh, workshop with Kathleen about five years ago, and that transformed my painting. I think from average to, I, I hope above average. Oh. <coughs> but yeah. there are techniques, there are materials that are really crucial if, if you want to be a good pastel artist. Uh huh. <coughs> so a good teacher along the way is not a bad idea. It, it's critical. critical. It's critical. Uh, I actually had a few pastel teachers before Kathleen uh, who helped me, but Kathleen really transform my art. And a lot of it was technique. A lot of it was the kind of materials you use. Mm -hmm. I use more soft pastels now, <coughs> fewer hard pastels, because <coughs> excuse me, the effect is, is just more vibrancy with the softer well, pastels. Well, let's talk about some of this vibrancy. Sure. We have three more paintings to look at. This one over here with the 
let's see, I would say that's a lake and uh, a beautiful white cloud passing by. Is that a lake or a river? It's actually the ocean. It's the ocean. But uh -huh. it's whatever you think it is. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. And, and uh, I, one of the things I notice about this one that I don't see in the others is that there's a large expanse that looks like it has nothing in it. The, the top left corner of the image <coughs> is just that certain cerulean blue, or I don't know what to call it. But I'm sure it's mixed of lots of colors, right? Or maybe I'm wrong. Generally... What's going on in that corner? What's going on in that corner? Where Gen I see nothing going on. There's a lot going on in that corner. Actually, yeah, I bet there is. Because to get that effect, I, I, I blended about three or four different pastel, different shades of, of blue in order to get that particular color. Sometimes the color of the pastel itself will be exactly the color that you want. But more often than not, it's a little bit off. So you end up blending various uh, colors. So there's a lot of judgment involved, and, and there's experience involved in terms of what colors you end up blending. So you'll, you'll put down several different shades of blue, and the order in which you put them down is also very important oh. because you want the primary color to be on top. You're going to have some undercoating that there could be a, there's a little bit of purple in that actually. Yes. That it's really difficult to see. see. Maybe yeah. a little pink. T tell us about the small one down here. What, what happened to the clouds that it turned orange? Or is this really your imagination? This is really my imagination. I see. This okay. is really my imagination. Good. I was worried here. This, this painting is on pastel mat, which has wonderful teeth. And, and by teeth, I mean the texture of the paper that grabs the pigment. It just grabs and holds the pigment. So you would think that putting pigment down on paper, the pigment would just fall off. It would just shed the, the pigment. But it holds it, it grabs it, and it's, it's really pretty secure. I do not use fixative. You don't use fixative, but no. everything is behind glass. Everything has to be behind glass because if you touch it, it will come off in your hand. Tell us about this one. So, this is my most recent painting, and uh, my wife Eliza has been encouraging me to be a little bit freer, to be a little less realistic, to um, be a little more vibrant in my coloring. And I've I really attempted in that to be a little bit more abstract and to um, really expand my color palette. Uh -huh. It'd be a little bit more. This this is a fall scene, obviously, which encourages with another that. river. Another river. Uh, reflections are a very rich way to express color as well, and and depth and perspective. There's something luscious about this one. One feels that there's just like you could <laughs> almost taste it. One could fall into the color. Thank one you. Could, yes, one is Thank like. You. I um I. I think I would gravitate toward this one and stand next to it for a long time. I, I, I love this painting. In, in some ways, it's not the classic way that I, I paint, but I think it's important to experiment. It is a little bit of an experimentation for me. Mm -hmm. It's going a little bit outside of the box. But it's very important for me to experiment and to try new things. And so, the sky also is really quite wonderful. Thank you. It's like you, you. you haven't spent... The focus is on the trees and the reflection rather than the sky and the, and the, and the clouds. Right, right. Yes. To answer the question that you asked about why this area was, it was a little bit vacant. Mm -hmm. There was just sky without cloud. Here you have sky, a little bit of cloud. But, but more variation here. A little bit more variation, but sometimes less is more. Yes. As an artist, you have an infinite number of ways in which you can compose a painting in which you can choose colors. And it's very tempting to put everything into it, to overload the painting. Taking out is important. It's important. And I'm, I'm learning. I still consider myself a young painter. I'm That's learning. That's wonderful. I'm learning all the time. <laughs> Every painting I do is an experiment. It's a challenge. It's a journey of discovery. And sometimes it's good to make it a little bit simpler and not load every corner of the painting up with, with something. something.
Right. You've gone a long way from these, this, this woods here. Thank you. Richard Cohen, you've done a superb job of explaining your medium and your art, and it was a great pleasure. I thank, thank you, you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Shane. So, uh, Richard Cohen will be showing at the Jewish Community Center in their Hall Gallery. I think it begins on February 1st. I think it's on for three months, and you can go and see his work there. Um, thank you for being with us at uh, Talking Art. My name is Jane Trigere. I'd like you to, if you wish, send me some message at the uh, email below with any names of artists you think I should be interviewing or any questions that I'm not asking that you'd like me to ask. See you next time. Bye.